Welcome back, everybody. And we have a question for you this evening. The question is this. Is making your bed a part of the Bible? 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse number 9 reads like this. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Welcome to Double Portion Podcast. I owe my life to you in every way, for you have paid the price for me. Not everybody at once, please. <laughs> Welcome back, Double Portion Nation, to another episode. And we are absolutely delighted and thrilled and overjoyed and bubbling with joy because you have chosen to join us for another episode. We're, our, our excitement is exceeding magnifical. That's a biblical term. Biblical word for you. Um, in all sincerity, it really is. <laughs> our producers look at it. Brother Pound, maybe we could behoove you to read your Bible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just teasing. <laughs> He's over here flagging on the on the little board. He's going to cut that out. Taking shots. Just teasing you, Brother Pound. We love you. Thank you for all that you do for us. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have you in the studio with us for another wonderful episode. And we are delighted to be joined again by Bishop and Brother Jeffrey Elder in studio. We are thankful to have them here. Two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. And before we go any further, we do want to thank you for your support, your continuing of coming back to listen to these episodes. And we want to think, thank, think. We want to thank each and every one of you that have commented, that have subscribed, that have liked and shared. And for those of you that haven't, we want to ask you why. Why have you not yes. commented, liked, subscribed, and shared? You know, why are you freeloading? It's free to like, comment, yeah, and share. This is free. We're giving you a handout. Yeah. We're giving you a handout. So just teasing, but please, if you can, leave a comment, like, subscribe, share. It does help this information and this content to get out beyond the circle that it is in right now. And we want that to happen. We want to give tools to young people that will help them become all that God wants them to become. So if you could help us with that, please do so. And this week, we are going to dive into something that may be considered a little bit more lighthearted, but is definitely still a necessary component to our walk with God. And in fact, I believe, and I believe Scripture bears this out, if we will do what we are going to talk about in this episode, it will help us overcome the heavier parts of our life. Um, in opening this up, there's two books that come to mind, and I can't remember uh, the complete name of one of the authors. Bishop, maybe you can help me with this, but it's Ordering Your Private World, and I believe his last name is O'Gorman. Yeah, I can't remember uh, what. I don't remember. I have it downstairs in my library. Let me look it up real quick. All right, Brother Jeffrey, if you can look that up. Gordon. His first name is Gordon. His last name is McDonald. Mc McDonald. Yeah, Gordon, Gordon McDonald. McDonald. Um, this idea comes from that book. And then another book <coughs> that is probably more well known for a Instagram video that floated around for a while is written by Admiral William McRaven. And he wrote a book titled Make Your Bed. Um, and even in the speech, if you have time, I, I encourage everyone to go watch the speech. He's talking about obviously making your bed, but he's also talking about doing the small things in your life. Um, so if you listen to the speech, he begins by saying, if you want to change the world, make your bed. And he begins to lay out the, his reasoning why you should do that. Well, we're going to come at that same idea, doing the little things in life doing the small things in life and we're going to come at that from that 
same premise. If we want to change the world, where do we start? Well, we don't necessarily just start with going out and changing the world because when you look at changing the world, that's a very big that's a very big vision, that's a very big goal. But in fact, we start back with the little things of life. Zechariah 4 and 10 says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice. And many of us <clears throat> have sang the song in the bridge. It says, Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? That actually comes from, that song comes from this portion of Scripture. And so we're going to open this up tonight, Brother Jeffrey, Bishop, and we're going to talk about doing the small things in life in order to accomplish the big visions and the big goals that God has given us. Well, it's a delight to be back with you all. It's certainly a delight to be back in studio with Brother Jeffrey and Brother Mitchell. And Brother Mitchell, you're freezing me out. If you could adjust that thermostat, please. It's four degrees outside and he's got the air condition. Uh, At your request. <laughs> I don't remember that, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh. This is fascinating. There are many things. I, I have heard that Admiral's speech, and it's inspiring. I guess the first time I heard something on this wise was the great coach of UCLA. What was his name? He won like Bobby Knight. No, Bobby Knight was for Indiana. Oh, look it up. Brian McKnight. Uh, he won like 10 basketball <laughs> NCAA championships. Nobody's come close to winning. He was the one that Lou Alcindor, who later became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, played for uh, many great. John Wooden. John Wooden. John Wooden, when he had a new recruit, a new recruit come in, the first thing that he taught them, the first fundamental that he taught them was how to put on their socks. And he was a stickler for a certain way that they had to put their socks on. And he, the reason why is because if they didn't put their socks on right, they'd get a blister. And if they got a blister, then they wouldn't play right. And if they didn't play right, they wouldn't win the championship. Attention to detail like that is almost an afterthought in our world today because people have just got to the place where uh, they don't understand standards of excellence. But the Bible, speaking of Caleb and Joshua, uh, said they had a different spirit than the other 10 men. The other 10 men were leaders. Every one of the 12 men that Moses sent in to uh, spy out the land, into the land of promise, to bring back, they were supposed to bring back a good report. But the Bible says that 10 of them brought back an evil report. But Joshua and Caleb were of a different spirit. And I think, Brother Mitchell, that's what we're talking about, is people that observe doing the things that seem like they're not necessary uh, to be a great we were just listening to some guitar playing and and listening to uh, a shout out to Brother Colton Duty. And uh, I've watched the growth of this young man as he has become better and better. And obviously you can have all the talent in the world, but if you won't spend the time practicing, the private time that it takes to learn how to really be good, uh, those small things that you're talking about. Everybody wants to play the song, but nobody wants to to learn how to play the song. They just want to play the song. And they don't want to learn the rudiments. They don't want to learn the transitions. They don't want to learn the the inversions. They don't want to learn if you're drumming, you don't want to know the, you know, you just want to play the rudiments. You don't want to have to learn the rudiments. And uh, not very many people, I don't know, even a protege has to practice. So when it comes to that. So uh, those are things that we're talking about today. Well, and 
a lot of people would say, why, like, for instance, we opened up is, and we'll answer this. If you want the answer to this, you have to listen to the end of the episode. I'm sorry, but we will answer the question, is making your bed in the Bible? But a lot of people would say, okay, so why why do I need to make my bed? Why? Here's another another thing that we should do every day. In fact, uh, doctors say that you should do this at least twice a day. Why do I need to brush my teeth? Why do I need to comb my hair? Another thing that we we may ask. Why what do I need that? To... <laughs> <laughs> Why do yes. I need to wear a hat? Why yes. do I need to wear a hat? We, we cannot, um, <laughs> what's the politically correct term here? We cannot, we cannot uh, point him out because he's wearing a hat. Yes. So yes, for all the people that, that wear hats. Socially shame me. Yeah, we can't socially. I wore there a we hat. Go. We can't. Didn't comb my hair. Didn't comb his hair. Um, <laughs> all, all of those questions. Why do I need to polish my shoes? But. There is a scripture in Song of Solomon. It's chapter 2, verse 15. It says, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine. For our vines have tender grapes. So we're given this idea that there are foxes, that there they are little foxes, but that they can raid this vineyard and steal the grapes because they are tender. They're little grapes that are on the vine and these foxes will come in and still us so when we are and still those grapes so when we take that scripture and lay it back over what we're talking about we begin to see that it's the little things that eventually build up into the big things that ruin the harvest that destroy the grapes so you might say well it's just making my bed but it's deeper than that it's establishing the discipline of making your bed sure you can get up and just run off to work or you can get up a few minutes earlier and make your bed and and where this goes over into our spiritual lives is if if you can establish the discipline to get up a few minutes earlier and make your bed then you'll have the discipline there to wake up a few minutes earlier and pray or to wake up a few minutes earlier and read the word of god or you'll have the discipline to step out and fast for 24 hours let's talk about the little foxes because i have gardened i haven't done it in years the reason why is because when i was a young man <laughs> my father grew a huge garden well he <laughs> planted it and uh we grew it yes my sister and i and i know why you guys are laughing <laughs> we won't laughing go down that marsh's story yeah. they did all the work and uh, uh, <laughs> but you would not realize how much damage a skunk or a fox can do in a garden. Yeah, they can destroy it, or a raccoon. They can destroy the garden so fast, and and so you have to find ways to eliminate what are known as varmints. Uh, I mean, the best way is to shoot them, but you don't want to shoot a skunk, you know. No. I'm not hauling that thing out of there. But, but you do, you build fences. You build fences against laziness. Laziness is a little thing, but it can turn into a big thing. And and the 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 little fox that says, oh, I don't need to pray today. But down the road, the damage that that attitude brings to one's life or even just the simple thing. You know, my father was a military man and I, I'm almost 60 years old. I still make my bed almost every day. I still make my bed on Sundays. We don't make our bed, but uh, mom on one side, she does the bed and I on the other side, when we get up, uh, we make the bed. We just little stuff to to keep to keep order in one's life and and i use that earthly example for for many of the things that uh, insignificant attitudes can turn into giant detriments in our life 
You boys have heard me preach a message when little sins grow up. And in that message, I talk about a true story. I actually read this story about a, a tribal chief in Africa who captured a tiger, a baby tiger, when he was little. And uh, uh, he had a son, and he thought that he would bring that cub tiger home, and the son and the tiger would grow up together and be good friends. Well, obviously, the tiger grew up a lot faster than the boy. And so you have this three or four hundred pound animal and this seven, eight year old boy that's playing with him. And there is a huge discrepancy between this tiger that at one time was smaller than that little boy, but in just a short time is bigger than that boy. And the old grandpa, one day they were playing and he saw something in that tiger's eyes when that boy was him and he, when his son, who was the chief, came home that day, the, the tribal chief, he told him, you better kill that tiger, you better get rid of him. He said, oh no, that's my son's pet. He said, no, he's not. He's wild. The wild nature of him will never change. You caught him in the wild. He wasn't born in your house. He was born in the wild. And, and he tried to talk his son into killing that tiger, and he didn't. Well, a few months later, the tiger did kill his son. And he saw it all happen. And he tried to reach his son before the tiger killed his son. And he did kill the tiger, but not before the tiger killed his son, because it seemed so insignificant and so little at that time, but it became a raging beast in his life that destroyed something that he loved so much. And so these things that you're talking about, Brother Jeffrey and Brother Mitchell, that seem so insignificant can be so important in our lives. And so we, 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 we want to keep those little foxes out. And we want to do the small things that later on become so significant in our life. The, the practice, you know, you've heard me say this. Handel made the statement. They asked him, how did you write Handel's Messiah? And he said, because I practiced every day. And the inspiration grew out of that practice. He didn't know at the time that he was writing Handel's Messiah that it was going to be what it was. But the practice brought about that inspiration and that, and that incredible magnificence. And that's the small things that you're talking about that, that grow out of those experiences in our life. We could talk about our lives personally. Uh, my, my love for the Word of God, which has become my lifestyle, you know, and it, it, to other people it was so insignificant when I was a teenager. But the hours that I spend in the Word of God... The hours I spent memorizing the Word of God, the little three by five cards, hundreds of maybe thousands of those little three by five cards that I started out every morning with three verses on them by the evening. Every one or two days, I'd have those three verses memorized. Well, I don't do that now. I probably still should. But that is like a tape recorder that just clicks on in my head when I'm preaching and stuff, you know, so... In in McDonald's book, he actually talks about how some of the things that are the most important things in his life are the things that cry out the least for attention. And so he he's talking about in in that portion of the book, he's talking about balancing his time and he's saying that he's married and he has kids. Well, that's an extremely important part of his life. But he can ignore that in his life for so long. And because his wife and his kids love him, they're forgiving of that. And so it doesn't cry out. And he, and he when he wrote the book, um, he's writing about a time in his life when he was a pastor. And so he talks about how he can go for weeks without study. And it won't necessarily affect him. It will, but it it's, it's silent. It doesn't cry out for for time. And then he talks about how some of the most insignificant things in his life cry out the loudest. And if he's not careful, he'll focus on those things and he'll neglect the things that are the most important. But one thing that's interesting that he draws out in that is if he, those, those parts of his life that are quiet because they're forgiving, 
if he negates that responsibility long enough, it will grow into a very big and serious problem. And it's the same way with us as Christians. You may be able to go a day without praying, but if that becomes a habit in your life, it's going to cause serious problems. And so if you go a day without reading your Bible, if you go a week without reading your Bible, yeah, you can still go to church. You could still be saved, but that's not... We were talking about this with our family a, a few weeks ago in a, in a group text that we have. And I I really have tried to adopt this in my personal walk with God. And I think every Christian should reach this point to where we stop asking, what do I have to do to be saved? Yeah. I already know what I have to do to be saved. We shouldn't be asking, can I get away with this and still be saved? We shouldn't be asking, is this going to affect me becoming all that God wants me to be. I call that the 10 men syndrome. The 10 leaders that they just went over and did what Moses told them to do. Yeah. But Joshua and Caleb, they had a different spirit. Moses is a more excellent spirit. Yeah. They, 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 they didn't just look and observe, but they, they, they brought back the spoils of the land, and they were willing to do what it took to conquer the land. And the others, it was just so much easier to give an evil report. Right there, Brother Mitchell and Brother Jeffrey, let's deal with this, because we're, we're dealing with young people that may not have a father like I had to inspire them. And nobody's going to make you get up and pray. Nobody's going to make you polish your shoes. Nobody's going to make you make your bed. Nobody's going to make you do your homework. Those silent things that that don't cry out to you. And, and you're going to be tempted to cheat. I, you can find cheat sheets all over the web to do stuff anymore. You know, and, and you don't realize that one day you're going to need, you're going to need the information that you're cheating yourself out of right now. And, and let's just use simple little stuff. Like the first thing that... It's a common fact that the first thing they look at when you go in for a job interview is your shoes. That's the first thing they look at. Did you polish your shoes? If you don't have enough discipline to polish your shoes, you know, and, and just simple little stuff like that, that my father taught me. But you may not have a father to teach you that. Nobody's going to make you go to church if you don't have parents that make you go to church. Nobody's going to make you. Somewhere you got to get a spirit of excellence in you that these small things that seem so insignificant are not small. And they're not insignificant. They are, they are massive. <clears throat> Sadly, I didn't, I didn't even learn how to run a checkbook, which is obsolete anymore almost, till I was in my late teens. Nobody taught me how to run a checkbook. Nobody taught me that my name was so valuable mm -hmm. that I could leverage my name and my name was worth more money to me <clears throat> than a lot of the things that I thought that I could buy to make money. And I had to learn little by little these things. And some of them were by trial and error and, and learn how to pay my tithe and offering. Nobody's going to make you do that, young man, young lady. These are things that that are so important to your success in your life. Yeah. And 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 in in a marriage <clears throat> learning how to talk to your wife, learning how to talk to your husband, learning how to be angry and talk about issues without insulting one another. Uh where where do you learn that? You know, do you do you have a certain way that you just blow off? And when you get mad, you call your wife names. And wh where did you learn that? Where did that little fox spoil that line? Did you control your thoughts when you got angry? Were you able to, in your mind, say, now, now hang on a minute. She may have a point there. I'm hearing her different. 
and I'm angry right now, and I'm not really thinking this through. And, and learning how to, to do those things, that those little things that makes a marriage so successful. The compliments instead of the criticism. Opening your mouth and talking to your wife instead of just assuming that she knows that you love her or whatever. And I can't speak for ladies because I'm not a lady, but I know that there are ways that I will tell you this speaking faith into your husband's life is massive young lady and you say well I need faith in my life well if you'll speak faith in his life he'll speak faith in your life and and just little things like this that are so important uh, this comes out of your private world nobody's going to make you do that you can be as big and as bad as you want to be you can have the vilest mouth that you want to have especially in this world. In fact, they encourage you to have a filthy mouth in this world. But out of your life, are you going to follow the scripture that says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Yeah. <clears throat> a few months ago, I was listening to a man of God preach. And he made the statement, he said, if you want... <clears throat> He said, if you want victory in your life, and he was talking about addiction. He said, one of the first things he'll tell, he's a pastor. He said, one of the first things he'll tell his saints that want deliverance from addiction. He'll tell them, wake up by seven and wash your car once a week. And you think about that. And he said, they'll, they'll ask him, pastor, I don't. Why are you telling me this? Wake up by seven, wash your car once a week. And it's the same principle that, that this admiral, admiral, admiral writes about in his book. The reason why you make your bed and the, the, the pastor says because when you begin to learn how to win the little victories that I woke up by seven, my car is clean, it's in order. He said it begins to build a perpetual motion of going forward and you win a little victory and then you win another little victory and eventually just like if you ignore these things, all these little problems build up into this giant problem. If you begin to win the little victories, you wake up by seven, you make your bed, your car is clean. You begin to build up to the point where you have momentum and you begin to win bigger victories. And you begin to win bigger victories and eventually you look back and you have fought your way through addiction. Or at some point in that God has delivered you from addiction somewhere, whether it's miraculous and instantaneous or it's a slow day by day process. Somewhere in there, you will look back and say, I conquered that sin. But it all started with the little victory. Yeah. It all started with if you did nothing else in that day, you can get into a clean car and there is that victory of the day at work might have been horrible. You might not even have woken up by seven. You might have woke up late. You didn't have time to make your bed. You didn't have time to comb your hair. You didn't have time to brush your teeth. But when you make it out the door to go to work, all of a sudden you've stepped into a clean car. And it's that reassurance that the world may be chaotic, but I at least I won this victory here in this place of my life. They have, they have found that. There's a psychological effect when you, you know, if your house is a mess or whatever, that your mind will begin to make it more than what it really is. So, you know, whatever, if you're in a mess, your car's a mess or your house is a mess, you'll look at it like, oh, this is going to take forever. But you realize as you begin to pick up things and put them back in their place it's not as as bad as as you had made it out to be or you'll just look at it as the whole picture the whole picture and people do that with their whole life they look at their whole life that's a mess and they look at the whole picture and they're they're seeing an image of of what perfection should be this is what i have to be to be perfect and so like Brother Mitchell was saying, you just have to start with a, a small thing. Some, uh, let's deal with another deal. There, there are perfectionists. There are people that just, you know, they're, they're OCD to the max, you know. 
if you move their pop at a restaurant a half an inch, they've got to move that plate right back or that glass right back to where it is. That is an obsession Yeah, that, that needs to be dealt with. Sometimes life can deal with that. But they are the ones that have the hardest time. Oh, yeah. Because they don't realize it. Uh, they have a difficult time learning how to play a music instrument because they want to know right now. They want to be able to sit down and play Tchaikovsky or Chopin or, or, or some apostolic song, you know, that's just phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I went from one extreme to the other there, <laughs> classical to apostolic. I, I can relate to that in music because I can hear so much yeah. of what's happening. But when I go to play the piano, it sounds like Ned in the first grade. That's and where you have to start. It's getting better. Yeah. But I, I can relate to that. Well, and it's like a a piano player that does does not realize the years of discipline that it learned, just learning transitions. Yeah. There are so many different transitions that you can learn. You can you you can learn tr jazz transitions. You can learn uh, fusion transitions. You can learn uh, country and western transitions. You can learn classical transitions. You can learn blues transitions. Some of them are similar, and a, a lot of the chord arrangements and and note arrangements are 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 similar. But but it takes years to learn those different variations and if you're going to be a good husband there's <laughs> that is a big deal you know and and you have to have the want to to do these little things in yeah. their private time uh you know <clears throat> you want to give her a massive house just start out giving her a single rose that's all you can afford right now dude and and make and let it be sincere uh, you know, uh, well, that's our society because as young people, we see what mom and dad have over a 25, 30 year period. And then we are like, well, I'm going to have that. Well, the way that we get it now is we just go out and mortgage, charge it. it. Yeah. But that's, you, you can't start there. Yeah. In Luke 19 and 17, Jesus said, and he said unto him, well, Thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And so this is what we're talking about, young people. If we, if we in our youth, will make it a discipline to take care of the little things, if we'll do it right now, if we'll, like that man of God said, and try it. Try to wake up by seven every day and wash the car once a week. Do it. Fine, and and this is kind of a different topic, but it it is needed, especially for for our our youth in this world. Find something difficult and do it. Find something hard. Find something that challenges your mind, challenges you to think, and 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 watch what happens. A few I heard a. Um, uh, I heard a man of God say this, and then I also heard, uh, I guess he would consider himself a philosopher say this. So I said, okay, I'm going to try to do something hard. So I set out to write with my right hand, which I've been somewhat ambidextrous my whole life. Um, but I was like, I want to write with my right hand. And you'd be amazed when you sit down and begin to try to do that, the mental fatigue where you really do feel in your mind, your body's not tired, but in your mind, because you you are literally expanding your brain. You're teaching your brain to think a way that it hasn't thought before. We need that. We need the challenge. Do something hard. But back to the topic, if we begin now in our youth to do the little things, to catch the little foxes and to put them out of the garden of our life, and if we do the little things now of tending the garden spiritually and caring for the soil spiritually, praying every day, fasting once a week, fasting once a week, 24 hours if it's possible, reading our Bible, a chapter a day, if that's all you can do, a chapter a day. If we begin those now, 
we will eventually reach the point where this steward reached, where the Lord looks at him, the Lord of his life, and for us it would be Jesus. And this is not, I don't believe that this will happen in our lives in eternity. I believe that this is a place on earth where we will reach a place on earth where God says, okay, you have been faithful in these little things that I've given you. Now I'm going to make you a steward of something great. Another little thing, another little fox that will catch us. And it's not really a little fox, but it's things like paying your tithe. Christians pay their tithes. Bring their tithe. Yes. We bring our tithe to the storehouse. There's no way around that scripturally. Literally from Genesis all the way through, tithing is in our Bibles. No tithes.com is not right. No tithes.com is <laughs> Yes. It's it's what what is that? It's a little fox. It's a little fox. Well, I'm I'm only it was ten bucks. So it's a dollar. Well, it's such a little thing. It's just a dollar. But it's not. It's a little fox that's trying to get in your spiritual vineyard. And then you will reach a point where in Malachi he said you are cursed with a curse. And so all of the sudden that little dollar bill that we refuse to pay, not because we needed a dollar bill, but just because we're fallen humanity that wants to rebel. And that's my dollar, but it's not your dollar. It's God's dollar. Yeah. And, and it's so insignificant compared to the 90% of blessing that God has given. Yeah. And eventually we reach a point where we're cursed and that little dollar has become a curse from God in our lives. And in another place it talks about how your money bags have holes in it. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out why you can't make ends meet. You can't make ends meet because God has cursed your finances. And with that curse on your finances, you're never going to make ends meet. You're never going to find happiness in the money. You're going to find happiness when you go back and catch that little fox and put him out of the vineyard. Uh, was it this? It was this last week, Bishop. We had uh, Brother Pastor Paul Bertram with us, and he talked to our church a little bit about tithing, and he said something that was really interesting that just jumped out to me. He said that God allots us to live on ninety percent, and so many times in Scripture, money is depicted as a God of this world. Well, we know that there is only one God. And so there's a couple things that jumped out to me. One of them, it's as if God asks for 10% because God doesn't need my money. Now, I'm not asking, should I or should I not pay tithe? I know I should pay tithe. But why? Why does God need 10%? I understand Bring ye the tithe into the storehouse. storehouse. Better say that right. <laughs> That there may be related to some of those. <laughs> yeah. Other Jenkins. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Bring you all the tithe to the storehouse <laughs> so that there may be meat in my house. I understand that and it and I understand what the tithing does, but why why would God ask for ten percent? Why would he say that this ten percent is mine, it's not yours? Which takes away from the hundred percent. And I think one of the reasons why is to see if if money is a God in our life. It's a test for us. Like you say, it's a faith issue. Can I give 10% to God and say, I trust him that he will allow me to live on 90% and mm -hmm. he will make ends meet even if there's no way for the ends to meet because I've shown him that he is God in my life, not my finances. But another place that my mind went to is in the book of Hebrews. It says that Jacob worshiped leaning on his staff. And then you go to the book of Psalms and it says, lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And so there's this aspect with, with tithings, but really with everything where we're really not leaning on our own might. There's always an aspect where we are leaning on God. And it's the same way with tithing. I know that's taking us a little bit off topic, but it's just we're well, here. So. It is. It, it, you don't have to be 
25 years old before you establish these these rudiments of faithfulness that are so vital and so important these seemingly little seemingly little and insignificant and I, I, you know not to go over this again we we've done some uh podcast on tithing i did one a few weeks ago on how to be restored to god the first place you start according to malachi is by bringing your tithe and offering to god and this is the only place in the bible that i know of where god said you prove me prove yeah. me see if i won't open you the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it that's a powerful statement when god says prove me now herewith if i won't do this for you and and that is uh that's one of those little foxes or one of those little private things that you establish where people scratch their head and say man that guy don't seem like he's that smart where what how is he being blessed like that you know it's that secret thing that that people overlook it's like your prayer life People overlook that, but that's massive in God opening doors. The Bible says when a man's ways are right before God, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's an incredible statement, especially in the day and age that, day and age that we live in. And personally, to my knowledge, I don't have enemies. I, I'm sure I do because the devil hates my guts, which he is my enemy. I hate his guts too. But I'm talking about with people uh, knowingly. I don't have intentional people that that I consider my enemies. I have ideology and I have spirits. And I have different doctrines that I am opposed to. And they are my enemies but not people. But even when I, when I get right with God. I do these private things that you're talking about. He makes, the Bible says he makes even my enemies to be at peace with me. And, and that, that word peace is massive in our world today. Jesus said, I will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. And uh, my peace I leave to you, with you. Not as the world giveth, but my peace these these are significant things, young men and young lady, and whoever's listening or watching this, uh, that that as we grow older, if you're not careful, you can begin to slide away from some of these things, and uh, that's a big deal. That is a big deal, because when you begin to slide away from these things, then those little foxes will creep back in. And they will try to make their way into the fruit. That's what they're after. They're after the fruit of your life. Yeah. The fruit of the vine. The fruit of mom and I. We accidentally grew a huge pumpkin in our backyard. The way we got that pumpkin is she bought bird seed. And the bird seed uh, fell out on the ground. And, and we, we scraped it up and threw it in the backyard. Well, I went out there last fall and there was a big old orange pumpkin so we put it on the front porch and the squirrels tore that pumpkin to shreds man they got in there and they ate all of the stuff out of the middle of that pumpkin you know and and did it in one night and we knew there were squirrels around but i didn't know they'd do that to the pumpkin you know mm -hmm. so uh the enemy uh he never gets tired of trying to get those little foxes in our life yeah and you touched on something there bishop and that is that it's a continuous it's a continuous pro it's a continuous cycle in our lives of going back and and since we're we've stuck to this analogy of a spiritual vineyard or garden going back and walking those fence lines and realizing okay this fence line in my life there's a hole here and I need to patch this whatever that may be i don't even necessarily want to say something here because then people categorize it and say well that's what he said but you go back to wherever that fence has been damaged and you say okay how do i fix this god how do i get this little thing in my life back in order back into its right process 
and being willing to work through that. In in the Old Testament, it talks about, I believe it's Abraham, how he offered sacrifice to God, and then it talks about him driving away the fowl of the air as they were coming to try and steal that sacrifice. And it was a continual, okay, God, I've offered this to you, but now I'm going to go all the way through this process until I see it come to fruition. I'm going to drive the fowl of the air away until you accept this sacrifice, until this portion of my life comes to fruition. I think this I think this all falls on the attribute of faithfulness. And I love how Hebrews 10 says it. said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, never wavering. But then it says, for God is faithful. And we... We are looking to God for that attribute of faithfulness. And when we, you know, as young people, when we look at people that are faithful, we say, you know, well, there's brother so-and-so. He's a faithful man of God. Or there's sister so-and-so. She's a faithful woman of God. Well, in the, in the fulfillment of that, we're not really going to be faithful until we reach heaven. And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That is us being full of faith. We have reached heaven. But we we look at them, we look at the battles in their lives, and we can look at the small or the foxes in their life that they have overcome. And we think to ourselves, well, man, how am I ever going to get there? How am I going to get to 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 faithfulness? It's It's in the what we're talking about right now the uh, the attribute of looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith how are we going to attain that faithfulness and so if it is what why is it that when you're praying you you have a good prayer meeting one day and then the next day it and this could happen every single day you could have a you could have a Holy Ghost blowout every single day, and the next day you go to pray, and the devil's like, hey, man, you don't need to pray today. You prayed so good yesterday. That Holy Ghost is going to get you through today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And but, but to overcome that is the process of faithfulness. It is holding fast the profession of your faith, never wavering. No, I'm going to pray today. No, I'm going to read the Word of God today. No, I'm not going to look at that today. There's never a time to say, well, let's just, let's just, just one time, you know. Yeah. Never a time to do that. Hold fast the profession of your faith, never wavering. And then we will eventually hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To me, that is the definition of faithfulness. I'm trying to be faithful right now. I'm doing my best. But there will be one day that I am full of faith. And that's when I reach those streets of gold. That's good. Well, young people, we hope that this has benefit, benefited you in some way, shape, or form. So we're back to the video. <laughs> no, we're back to 1130 at night in the studio. <laughs> oh. Thank you for joining us in this episode. Before we close it out, a couple things. Um, we do strongly encourage you to read those books that we mentioned at the beginning. Also, a couple other resources that talk about this very subject. One of them is a podcast from Biblos, and it's called, I believe it's called It's All in a Day. Another resource would be um, if you go into CGC pueblo live on youtube or you can download our app cgc pueblo brother nathaniel urshan preached a sermon here a couple weeks ago and he titled it it's all in a day's work and he talks about this very thing doing all that you can do for god in a day doing the tasks that are set before you those are excellent resources that will also help you with this topic once again we love you Thank you for joining us. If you liked this, uh, if you liked this podcast, please like, subscribe, share it, 
leave a comment down below. We would love to have a conversation with you about this. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you on the next one.